afternoon, everybody. Or morning, or evening, whenever the fuck you happen to be watching this. Charlie from Purposeless Rabbit Holes here to discuss a five month old demo because this goddamn game got delayed. I am a little late to this party, I will admit. I've already made a Dying Light video, one themed around why I love the original game, and I didn't expect to make another video about the series until that new game dropped, but what the hell. It seems like I've got a long wait ahead of me, so in order to curb those delay cramps, I'm gonna make a video that's gonna become immediately outdated the second that game drops. <laughs> I don't usually make videos like this, but today we're gonna be doing a little trailer analysis and pick through that 20 some odd minute demo they put out a while back. We're mostly doing this today because I have no friends that are into the series, so I can't talk with people about it, and if I go any longer without talking about Dying Light 2, I'm gonna fucking explode! Let's just go through bit by bit, starting from the beginning, and I'll bring up anything I notice. So first off, we get a look at a local tavern in the city, which is the central location of Dying Light 2. Seems like some just, you know, random city in Europe that happens to be the location of some form of civilization. Right off the bat, we see a comically excessive amount of quest markers floating around as Aiden pushes through the crowd, which just cements the fact that this place is important. I will mention though, it feels weird seeing quest markers pop up right at this particular instant because it doesn't feel like the player is controlling Aiden right here. This definitely feels like a cutscene in terms of how the camera's moving and how Aiden politely squeezes by this lady as to avoid spilling her drinks. He's a classy guy, that Aiden. Either way, these numerous quest markers are probably just there for demo purposes to show off how many there might be at any given point. Moving forward a bit, here we get a sexy vista of this central part of the city. Man, this game is looking gorgeous. Let's hope it stays that way. Get that Ubisoft shit out of my house! Cynicism aside, what I like about the graphics so far is that it doesn't seem like there will be a downgrade. It looks great, but it doesn't look unattainable. This is an anthem. And here we get our first look at man-on-man -man combat in Dying Light 2, and right from the jump it looks a thousand times better than it was in the first game. We'll see even more cool shit during the climax of the demo, but this right here is just some solid core combat. Looks like a lot of fun. Love the new block move, really important addition. Also, Jesus, Aiden really has it out for human heads. That's gonna be my go-to move when starting off combat scenarios, that's for goddamn sure. A few seconds later, we get to see how Dying Light 2 is handling its weapon mods, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what to think of it yet. It certainly looks cool when Aiden flicks on the electricity upgrade to his blade, but I'm really curious how this is gonna play out over the course of lengthier combat encounters. So as you can see, the way this particular mod in the demo works is that Aiden turns it on and is rewarded with one extra devastating hit that inflicts an electrical status effect. This is very different from the original game, in Dying Light 1, you would upgrade a weapon, and from that point on, the weapon would constantly inflict status effects on enemies automatically. This time around, it seems that you have to flick on your weapon upgrade whenever you want to inflict an enhanced attack. And even then, it seems like you'll land one hit, or maybe two, and the mod will turn itself back off. I'm gonna take a guess here and say that the more you upgrade a specific weapon, or the better the initial upgrade, Dying Light 1 style, the more enhanced status effect attacks you can land before the mod turns itself off and has to recharge. Really curious how long it takes for these things to recharge, if you can get an upgrade that decreases the recharge times? Man, questions, questions, a lot of fucking questions. Now we get to the demo's first example of decision making, a new key component of Dying Light 2. I really like how cinematic this moment is, plays out in a way that avoids the RPG cliche of characters awkwardly standing around and staring you down for minutes on end while you determine what the fuck you're about to do next. Not all of the decisions are like this, as we'll see later in the demo, but this decision is timed. So bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. So here's where we come to a worry of mine, and I'm sure it's a worry that's shared by a lot of people. I just mentioned that classic cliche, you know, of awkward NPCs standing around staring you down in RPGs, and it's fun to point and laugh at that, but it's like that, so you have some goddamn time to think. Dying Light 2 seems to not want to give you time to think, and that's not innately a bad thing, it adds pressure and immersion to certain curated moments of tense decision making, but what I'm preemptively not a fan of is the way this game's save system will work in conjunction with this new decision making system. So in Dying Light 1, and now 2, you cannot hard save. The franchise is entirely reliant on autosaves. Now the first game autosaves like crazy, so it's not a bad system in terms of keeping your progression intact, but if I'm making these huge decisions, I really don't want to rely on an autosave that overwrites my whole shit the second I make a game-changing decision that locks me out of huge swaths of content. This is clearly a deliberate tactic by Techland to give their game replayability. They've said it time and time again. And again, aiming for replayability is not innately a bad idea at all. But I don't want to have to replay the whole goddamn 100 hours game to get back to the point where I made that one decision I regret or some shit. Look, think about it this way. What if you played Skyrim and you couldn't hard save before engaging in a vital 
endgame conversation. Also, let's pretend that based on this hypothetical Skyrim conversation, one fifth of the entire map that you've never seen will be locked or unlocked forever based on what you do. You'd wanna, uh, maybe you'd wanna save before going into that conversation, just in case. Sure, being able to pop back to the beginning of an encounter and try again, or hell, popping back like three hours to replay a huge section of stuff that you feel like you did wrong, that kind of stuff isn't exactly immersive or realistic, but it allows me to poke the game and see how it works without having to restart the fucking thing from scratch. It allows me to craft my own experience on my own terms at my own pace. I don't know, we'll see how I feel about it when I get my hands on the finished product, but as of now, I am real skeptical. Back to the positive stuff, hardcore parkour. I'm just gonna acknowledge and count up any new moves I see as I see them. Rope swing. Victorian Assassin's Creed thing. What was that, Unity? Okay, wait, pause. So I just want to stop here to ask a kind of random question. How will NPC interaction work in Dying Light 2? Those people Aiden runs by on the roof. If I wanted to, could I just stop and chop those motherfuckers to pieces? Or will most interactions with innocent NPCs be similar to the safe houses and open world in Dying Light 1, where you can't harm anyone at all and your weapons are completely sheathed in safe zones? In Dying Light 2, it seems like areas with non-hostile NPCs are a little less centralized than the safe house interiors of the first game, like the tower or that other tower. Instead, it looks like there's gonna be more little pockets of people spread all throughout the map, hanging out on rooftops and in back alleys and shit, so it would be weird if NPC interaction was as strict as Dying Light 1. I personally hope Techland goes full Fallout with NPC interaction unless you do something like, say, Attack these people if you're feeling particularly evil that day. And then they'll start attacking you in self-defense, and this whole violent incident will lower your standing with whatever faction these people are associated with. But yeah, I'm sure not every NPC interaction will be like that. This isn't gonna be like the Outer Worlds where you can kill every single character whenever you want. I guarantee there will be neutral, safe house-esque locations similar to those in the first game where you can't take out your weapons, uh, and I bet that tavern at the beginning of the demo is one of them. Places where you pick up your quests, like the tower or Jazir's farm. Full swing! Love the way certain parts of the environment move when you use them to traverse, or even break and force you to improvise an alternate route like this crumbling building edge from later in the demo. Next up we get a look at Aiden's new binoculars. I'd wager these binos have their own special button designation like the flashlight in the first game. Maybe one of the d-pads or R3 because it seems like these binoculars are going to be very important. They're used constantly throughout the demo and right here we can see their immediate usefulness. Aiden looks at a gathering of NPCs across the way, an icon is created to represent whatever's going on over there and it gets put on his HUD and also map, assumedly. I'm going to be scoping the horizon for side quests with these babies all day. And here we see the coolest goddamn thing ever. I can't stop coming. In one fell swoop, they gave us a real ass physics based grappling hook and a Paisa suit that isn't just a fucking joke. A good joke, by the way, I love the Paisa suit and that Mario shit, so good. Now look, the original game's Batman-ass grapnel is classic, I love the way the grappling hook works in Dying Light 1, but I like this way more. I cannot fucking wait to swing through these city streets, god damn, I can't wait to see what those speedrun motherfuckers do with this technology, it's gonna be madness! They're gonna turn this shit into Spider-Man two weeks after release in a way that the devs never thought possible, guarantee it, can't wait. Alright, and right here we get an early look at uh, the way Dying Light 2 is handling interiors, and and man, I am excited as fuck for this. So Aiden jumps up a wall and into what looks like someone's abandoned apartment. He turns, sees a zombie, drop kicks the fuck out of it, and is on his way. This little loop of weaving in and out of buildings is happening everywhere in the demo. Techland has expanded their accessible open world interiors to a level I never expected. Look at all these interiors! <laughs> that humans during the day and zombies during the night hook that Techland was touting a year or so ago doesn't feel so bad now because you can clearly see low level biters are everywhere in these building interiors. And building interiors are like half the game! Having been fleshed out in an amazing, almost unbelievable way. After watching this demo, it really seems like there are all kinds of places to go, even during the day, where zombies are thriving. And hell, fighting zombies on a regular basis during the day in Dying Light 2 is probably gonna be more absorbing and intense than ever, seeing as half of them are shambling around inside cramped rooms that don't give you the space and forgiving freedom of Haran's rooftops and open streets. I love the way Aiden sees all these zombies and then he has to cram through a wall into another room to escape the situation. Just, ah, so good, so cool, so well done. Wall run, fuck yeah. The wall run was actually a move that was originally in the first Dying Light, but it was removed before release because it seemed a little janky. Fun fact though, you can add it back in with a mod. Either way, great to see it in game, can't wait to use it to dunk on motherfuckers. 
I already showed it before, but I love the way this pole breaks to get Aiden across the street. I'll count that as a new move. And here we have our first real look at the infected as Aiden enters the dark zone. <laughs> I adore this initial moment where Aiden dodges that jumping zombie, although I'm curious if that'll actually happen in the game. This demo has a really minimalist HUD though, so maybe dodging the zombie requires a button input, not unlike the insta-escape from the first game. The way Aiden clicks on his UV flashlight here without opening his gadget menu is interesting. Is the UV flashlight now a more integral gadget that's always equipped? I hope so, seems pretty fucking important these days. The way Aiden grabs this stick to simultaneously acquire a weapon and block off the entrance behind him, so dope! All right, so so here is another moment uh, that might be cause for concern, at least for me personally. When Aiden is trying to get this door open, the player is managing three different meters at once. A QTE prompt meter for the button mashing, a stamina meter that decreases in tandem with every parkour move and physical attack, and apparently when you try to open a door, and a constantly decreasing infection meter that only refills in the presence of UV light. I don't know, I just don't want this game to get bogged down in tons and tons of attention-grabbing meter management. I'm sure it'll be well balanced in the final product, and I'm also sure that these meters will become less and less of a factor as the game progresses due to upgrades you'll receive in your skill trees to give you more stamina, lower your infection rate, that kind of stuff. But currently, it's looking like the first chunk of this game might potentially be very tedious and frustrating. The first Dying Light had the exact same problem though, and I still learned to love it even the beginning hours where everything is way more arduous and dangerous. Makes the end game all the more satisfying when you have infinite stamina and high health. I wouldn't sacrifice that sense of progression for the world. But these meters though, I'm still wary. So Aiden makes his way out of the dark zone, we get to see this incredibly badass swing thing, I don't know what to call it, and finally our main man catches up to the perpetrators of his friend Frank's attack by Mission Impossible jumping right onto that car. <laughs> I really like this sketchy stoned driver character. He immediately stands out as a more unique and memorable NPC than almost anyone in the first game. This next bit introduces a concept that was almost entirely absent from the first game, and that is stealth. Aiden uses his binoculars to scope out the place and proceeds to crouch his way through the compound like Sam motherfucking Fisher, and that is so cool to me. Again, the HUD in this demo is really minimalist and I feel like it's hiding a lot of stuff, so I can't really get a grip on just how in-depth this stealth is gonna be. I don't see any alert indicators, a la Far Cry or Dishonored, so I'm not sure how you can tell if you're properly hidden. And also, this first stealth section in the main village area, if Aiden just immediately revealed himself to these people, what would happen? Would you fail the mission instantly? Or, or would the people see you and immediately alert other guards? Or, or can you talk to some of these people? But yeah, this stealth segment, really wonderful stuff. Really scripted and pre-planned and played through a thousand times to get just right, I'm sure. But if the finished game is anywhere near as dynamic as this segment presents itself, then we are in for a fucking treat. I am curious how many stealthy routes there are to get to the colonel in general. Could I hypothetically get to him without being seen once? Could I kill him before we even have that conversation, before he even sees me? Just how close to Dishonored are we talking here? I would really like another Dishonored game, by the way, Arcane. Just, uh... Just in case you're listening, but look at that, stealth kill prompt. Bet you don't have to wait 25 fucking hours to unlock it this time. So now, here we are at the end of the demo, and this big ass decision isn't timed, hell yeah. After our demo player makes the call to go on the offensive with the colonel's men, we get a look at some premium mano a mano, and this whole combat sequence is so relentlessly badass. It also begins with a great tension building synthy music cue. Sadly, Techland isn't bringing back the first game's composer, but if this tiny bit of music is anything to go by, I'm sure the new guy's gonna do just fine. I'm glad they're retaining elements of the first game's synth soundtrack. You can hear its influence all throughout the demo, especially during the chase. Dying Light 1 has a really subtle and memorable score that adds a lot to the atmosphere, so I'm excited to see what Dying Light 2's composer is gonna offer in response. All I really want is to be able to hear the first game's theme again, because I fucking love that track. All right, back to combat though. The way the grapple is integrated into combat as both a way to grab physics objects and a way to chain into another move via swinging around, God, it's so fucking good! I particularly love that grapple pull. The way it pops up that piece of floor is fantastic. I hope emergent moments of physics-based mayhem like this are prevalent all throughout the game, because this right here is some dark messiah shit. <sighs> 
in a previous gameplay demo, you can see Aiden go for some random bucket of death and basically use that shit as a finishing move to put some dude off balance, so I foresee many more moments of emergent, chaotic, physics-based combat like this grapple attack in the future. God, I can just watch this shit all day! I know it's a dead horse at this point, but I gotta mention, Aiden must have a fucking adamantium skeleton the way he eats that Scorpio shot. The way this thing wrecks everyone else's fucking bone structure makes me wonder just how powerful Aiden really is. At the very least, clearly our boy's been drinking his milk. The final thing I want to touch on here is Aiden's dodges when he's fighting this heavy guy. The parkour dodge from the first game has definitely been shortened in terms of length. It's puny compared to the dodge of the first game, but I suppose it's probably that way to keep fights grounded and close quarters, adding a bit more intimacy to combat. You can also see Aiden duck during the middle of one of his dodges, and I assume that'll be executed by tapping the crouch button in the middle of a dodge. That's pretty damn cool. That's also pretty much it for the Dying Light 2 demo. Well, except for these fuckers. In conclusion. It's crazy how still, even after a 30 minute demo, we really don't know shit about this game. We don't know how the inventory works this time around, we don't know the control scheme, we haven't seen any of the upgrade or quest menus, we haven't seen any special zombie variants besides these jumping beans, we don't know exactly how weapon upgrades function, there's a boatload of shit we're still in the dark about, so to speak. <laughs> and you know, I'm fine with that. I'm so used to games giving me every single piece of the product before the thing even fucking launches that it's actually quite refreshing to see developers showing restraint and not spilling their beans all over the fucking lighthouse whenever they have a chance. Go watch the lighthouse, you fucks. It's on streaming now. Go watch it. It's a, it's a movie masterpiece. Me me go. She took me in the parlor and said, won't you be me beau? let me go.